Thank you all for coming. I know it's back from lunch, so I'm tired. I'm sure you're all tired. If you fall asleep, whatever, not a big deal. I understand. Uh, but hopefully it's interesting enough. Uh, a little bit of background on this talk. Scott Nacello has given some sort of iteration of this talk over the past few years at many different conferences. I have inherited it since Scott has left Columbia. Um, I'm really excited for it. This talk brought me to Columbia. Scott brought me to Columbia, so it's, it's kind of cool full circle to, to come here. With that said, thank you, Scott. I appreciate everything you've done for Columbia, our team, and especially me. He's sitting right here, front row for me, and I, I appreciate all that. And he's already left Columbia, like I said, so it's pretty great. All right. Um, I'm mostly going to be talking about how we are now, but I wanted to give a little bit of background just so you can kind of understand the big strides that we've made, especially in the last year. So 2017 uh, is when Delivery Engineering was created as a team. We all know that DevOps is not a team. It is not a job title. I gave Scott a ton of flack for my job title being DevOps Engineer. Um, but in their defense, delivery engineering mostly focuses on developer tooling. Um, we care a lot about providing uh, Azure services uh, as platform as a service in a um, reliable, repeatable, cost-effective way. And I'll be talking about that, I'll be saying that over and over again with a lot of what we're doing. So again, in 2017, Columbia brought in a, uh, a cloud-first uh, mindset, and we had some options to go over uh, of what we could do, how we can implement that. So one of the options was the Azure portal. If you've ever seen... <laughs> the only person I know that would be happy with. <laughs> uh, like anything, any UI, it's click, click, click. It's not exactly repeatable. It's not easy to do. And if you've ever done anything in, anything manual in production, it's not always the best way, right? You don't usually want everyone to have access to production and be able to do just kind of whatever they want. So that might be great for the sandboxes, POCs, but not long term for us. And then we also had marketplace tasks. These, uh, they're not just from Microsoft that put these out there. Uh, it, it can be individual contributors, it can be a bunch of different people. And the release cycles for those wasn't great. They can just drop off without notice as well. So long term we were like, nah, that's probably not a great idea either. Another option was some sort of combination of Ansible, Terraform, and Chef. Our team at the time had already had experience with Terraform and Chef, but we noticed that Terraform was heavily skewed towards AWS and not Azure, at least at the time in 2017. Um, and then we weren't getting the features as quickly as, as we wanted, so that was a worrisome for our, our thought. And then also there was a custom option. So we ended up going with a custom option. And I'm calling this CSC Suite at the moment, even though we only had one at the time, uh, because later on I'm going to talk about more of what we've done and how we've expanded it. So CSC Suite uh, 1.0, if you've gone to the other PowerShell talk today, um, you'll see that there isn't just one way to deploy to um, Azure, and PowerShell isn't the only way to do it. Um, and it doesn't have all of the features, especially back then. So we had to do some combination of ARM templates, Azure, uh, PowerShell, R, uh, Azure RM, that at least that module, we had no integration tests at the time. It was just um, minimum viable product, just trying to get it in, trying to get it going. And then also, we were, since we are new enough as a comp or old enough as a company, uh, we didn't have to worry about infrastructure, like actual physical servers. We wanted to do platform as a service and, so and software as a service. We, again, since this was 2017, DevOps wasn't new, nothing was new. So we, we took inspiration from other places. Um, Scott was pretty jealous of how 18F had everything going on. So a lot of this is, is what we are, how we formed. 
Um, even with delivery engineering being the cloud infrastructure management team, that's pretty darn close. I would say that that's who we are. Everything is in source control, what we're doing, what our developers are doing. Everything is tested, or at least everything of ours is tested now. Uh, but that, you know, this is all the goal, right? Everything is the goal. And no matter what we change underneath, this is what we wanted to do, who we are, always will be. And then another was Capital One Software Clean Room. If you aren't familiar with the clean room, it's mostly used in hardware engineering to keep the environment as clean as possible, clean out the uh, particles so nothing gets into the, the hardware itself. Um, they even have procedures of the engineers having to wear booties, having to have an air shower, you can't wear hair gel, all that kind of stuff. So the whole purpose of that is keeping things clean and, and everything like that. So a way for software is everything in source control. That is your one true, that's what's going on, that's what it is. Um, production changes via code only. Uh, again, how I kind of talked about the portal, we didn't really like that for production. People make mistakes, everything happens, right? But at least code can be tested, it can be repeatable. Failure stop pipelines, same kind of thing where everything's clean, you don't want bad product out there, you don't want to be making mistakes. Of course that happens, we all, we're human, right? But it's another stopgap for that, keeping things clean. Everything uh, change tested, every change is tested, Again, along those, all of those same things, they're just building on top of each other. And then evidence is captured. What works, what doesn't work. So where we are today. So I wanted to give you a little bit of understanding of how we use Azure. Uh, we have three shared environments, dev environment, a test environment, and then a production environment, a system integration test environment. And then we have some shared services in there. We have service bus, API, uh, API Management Gateway, Express Route, ADLS, and we have about 100 plus APIs per, per environment. And then for on our side, we have about 10 customer teams that is about 150 people. So here's CSE Suite 2.0 as of today. We've made a lot of changes, especially in the last year, like I said. Um, we have about, as of this morning, I just checked, we have 570 tests. You'll see later on, I have a screenshot from December that's about 530, so we're constantly adding tests, we're making it better. And one of the catalysts for that was our, one of our main engineers who was, built, was writing a lot of this code left, and people didn't really know how everything worked. What's the best way to know how to do that? You test, right? And then we made a change. We moved from the Azure RM module to the AZ module. That took about a month and a half to two months to do. Um, what we do is we're a, we're a wrapper for our internal customers. So they don't have to change all of their code, right? We do that for them. And I'll show that a little bit later in detail. But that was a big thing. that They didn't notice that change whatsoever. And that took us quite a long time. I. I can't imagine how the rest of the company would ha be able to handle that if they all had to go through and change all of their, their PowerShell and everything. And then we have something called Azure Platform. That is mostly for our RBAC and our environment builds. That's, that's not too new, but it's, it's a main thing. That's, it's not what we had before. It's, we're building on it. AZ Pipeline Templates. This has been a huge thing for us. We put that in this year. We have about 50 templates, and I'll show you a little bit later. That actually goes to about 1,200 pipelines. So it's the same kind of stuff over and over and over again that we've been able to extract and make things easier for, for our customers. And we have an Azure self-service, which is pretty cool. Um, we have that for being able to remove resource groups, where uh, so it's it's in code we don't have to worry about that and then also we have temporary elevated access for in in any environment that's needed uh, everything is in source control it's auditable there's that and then another thing that we did last year was we went from about 15 on-premise physical servers for our build servers to 20 and the best thing about that is we can 
expand that, contract it, we can do whatever. It's much, much more cost effective and we don't have to get new physical <laughs> servers to be able to keep adding builds. So this is a uh, diagram of, of just the platform admin and I'll show you later what it looks for our customers, but this is what it looks for us. So like I said, we have about 50 different templates and I'm gonna show you what the RBAC looks like because that's probably the, the simplest we have. And, and usually everybody kind of knows what RBAC is, right? So RBAC is code. So we, as code, but it's YAML. It's not really code, but you know. We're DevOps, we like, we like YAML. So again, everything at, uh, in source control, this is our one source of truth. It's auditable, there's no miscommunication with who has access to what. It's very obvious. And even if it's not super obvious, it's really easy to find out. And then this is the same kind of pattern that we do over and over and over again through, throughout everything. And this is um, the red stage here, the RBAC build YAML for us. And so here's the RBAC pipeline. Uh, again, uh, we have the templates. So before, the, the template itself is about, mm, about 30 lines or so, which isn't a big deal. But if you think about if everyone else was doing those 30, it gets really big really fast. And if you have to make one change, you have to make changes everywhere. This allows us to make them in one spot. And then really the most important thing that we have right now is, these, is line 22 and 23, and that's removing access once uh, they're no longer in the, in the config YAML or they were added manually incorrectly in the portal. So then that, this keeps it clean. It really is the one source of truth. It removes everything that's unnecessary. So then here's a look at our pipeline. Okay, we have more than 30 lines, cool. Uh, <laughs> a lot of this is actually set up that we've built ourselves. You'll see that this is also calling separate uh, templates as well. Uh, a lot of that is something that we've, we've built in to make it easier for us. Again, it's repeatable. If we need to make a change, uh, then we can do it in, in just one spot, or at least you know, a couple maybe, but much, fit, much faster. Our documentation. We made a huge stride in our documentation this year. Uh, before, it was on a physical server, on a Linux server, which we are huge Microsoft, so we usually are all Windows servers, and that has its own challenges. Uh, and we, it was an implement, uh, implementation of read the docs, if you've ever seen that. The new one is still using the, the engine the, um, that would build the docs, the same thing that's that um, read the docs uses, but it's a lot better now, and we can, we can change a lot more things. It's being hosted, we can do it on the fly. We're able to help everyone. And how this is built now um, is everything go, uh, individual repos get their documentation built, and then one of the pipelines sends all the documentation in a zip file to the storage account, and then now it's a static website. It gets built once an hour, which some people think it's a little slow, but it's a big change for us, so that was, that was the most exciting. And then here's how we do our documentation for the examples um, in order for our customers to consume everything. So at the top here, we have this one line of include, and then we have what configuration file that you want to include. What that does is that takes this con configuration file. This configuration file is what we do with our tests. So our documentation is automatically updated when our tests are updated. So if we make any new changes, all of our new changes get into our documentation. It's, I think it's the most helpful. We're able to put in comments in, in everything, be able to give more explanation of what they need. I think it's a pretty cool process. I know I was blown away. Uh, when I first came here, I thought that was, it's so unique to not have to worry about documentation all the time, right? And so now we're gonna take a little bit of a look to see what it looks like for our, on our customer side. And this is kind of the same flow um, as, whoop, there we go, as our last one where you know you have the YAMLs, 
you grab you grab you have your build and then it has the releases so this is an API template we have it's about alone I checked yesterday it was about 150 lines again that's extracting for everyone else they only have to do about 15 in their their pipeline to make it a lot easier and everything that it's doing is we have our infosec our security requirements in there. It's doing credential scanning. It's doing uh, code scanning, checking for vulnerabilities, code smells. Then it builds the API, and it does more more testing, spec, spec flow testing specifically. It deploys the the tests, and then it runs some more unit tests. So it's quite a lot going on. And we're able to do all of that and change all of that in just one spot. One of the th another change that we did this year is we have this parent-child configuration. Uh, it works on inheritance similar to programming. So before, you had to have one config file for every environment. And it had to be for every service. So say you had five services in three environments that's 15. Now with this, this parent child, if everything is the exact same, so in this case um, we have a function, so if all of these settings are the exact same, you can use just the one file. Um, that's not, not everyone uses just one, sometimes they need some specific overrides just with how they've named things, but for the most part this has reduced our YAMLs an insane amount. So if you think about it, if they're all the configs are the same, then it's going from 15 to 5. Big difference, a lot less. Um, and then, like I mentioned, uh, so it's a parent child. Well, if we wanted to uh, just change the site name, before you had to copy the entire thing, put it in a different file, and change that one record. Now, you just do function, site name, and then change the site name. And that's it. That's all that's in that file. So it's much more obvious what's different and what's changed. We have been also switching to multi-stage pipelines this year in Azure DevOps. It's been pretty interesting to see how that's been changing. Microsoft's trying to get, get rid of the release pipelines. So this is an option for us. We've been going, our team personally has been working on this quite a lot to test it for our customers. To, we are personally using it so we know the pain points. And also, uh, we can still do the templates. There's a template there, template there. It's easy to just be able to use the templates over and over again. And then uh, all of these, is just it's different environments, just similar to the releases. This is what the multi-stage pipeline looks like if you've never seen it. We're able to create, uh, once, once the artifact is built, you're able to deploy synchronously to multiple different environments. And then once those all pass, you're able to go to production if you want. Our integration tests. Um, like I said earlier, as of this morning, we have 570. This was just the beginning of December. So we're, we're pushing pretty hard. So we have three steps to CSE Azure. The first one is a pre-merge, and that is just your feature branch. You, we have a process to where you only have to run those small subset of integration tests over and over and over again. So you're able to isolate those 570 now to you know 10 or 20, how many ever that has. And then you're able to add more tests to those individual. So it can go through pretty quickly. Um, we have about. Depending on which one you have, it can run from a couple seconds to a couple minutes, but it's significantly faster. This entire suite, uh, this, next, this next step here is the CSE merge, which is what I'm showing. The, all of our tests run, all of our test suite runs in this, in this stage, and it takes about 45 minutes total. And that's, we're able to run it in parallel. And while that sounds really long, and it is to wait, it sucks, uh, but in the general sense, it's been able to actually catch quite a lot of problems instead of just running, you know, uh, running just a few of them. So and then we have our post merge, which just merges everything and, and deploys our artifacts. 
So then we have um, our new change process. If you were in the CAB talk, I kind of mentioned a little bit that we're, we just started implementing this, which is really exciting. Uh, we are putting in, creating the change request, checking that the change request was already approved or if you had a standard normal emergency, it's checking all of that. And then if you have a standard or an emergency, it, it checks and then let go ahead, it lets you go ahead and, and do your release. If you're doing a normal change and it's not approved, it wasn't in there before, it stops your release, makes it fail, you have to go get approval, and then uh, you're able to complete it after that. Thank you everyone for being here again. I have a bunch of passes for Columbia Employee Store if you want those, and I have a bunch of stickers. Feel free to, to come get some. Okay, so we have a little bit time for questions before we start to the Q and A session. Uh, any any questions? One question, Brian. Mike to Brian. All right, yeah, we're recording it, so I can't touch the mic. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you had a lot of YAML in your slides, and um, YAML is great um, because humans can read it, but it's not for humans, it's for computers. Um, how do you actually deal with the YAML because you are simplifying something, but you've introduced your own concepts, and now it's like a new set of YAML, so how do you, how do you train your users to use that? I'm done. You want me? I can, we can do whatever. Um, yeah, so like I was saying, that documentation that we have and how it's updated every time, um, that's a big, that's how we train them to do it. And then we also have YAML linting that we've built into our pipelines as well. Uh, and then we also train them. That's a big part of it. We work really, really closely with, with all of our development teams and try to make it as easy as possible. And then uh, on the PowerShell side, we just have a process in there to handle everything internally. Referring to previous question, I wonder if you guys can devote some time and maybe help your customers. Open API has a way to describe JSONs or YAMLs of the protocols, and the Swagger editor just builds it at runtime. Maybe you can build something similar if you're like feeling explorative. <laughs> but okay, my questions. Um, so PowerShell versus SDK, why the choice was on PowerShell? I have more. Okay. Uh, PowerShell was easier to pick up. It had more functionality at the time, and the the changes happen much faster in PowerShell than they do in the SDK. We recently have looked at the SDKs, and there's still a lot of functionality that is not possible. Like we can't create storage accounts in the SDK. At least that's what the documentation said. We were trying to figure it out, right? Uh, but we, you have to use PowerShell or the portal or ARM templates. And we've tried to reduce the ARM templates as much as possible because they are quite difficult to pick up if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, actually that was my next question about ARM templates because infrastructure as code, like Microsoft answer to infrastructure as code was supposed to be ARM templates. So I'm wondering what failed for you in this regard. Sorry. Uh, yeah, ARM templates, one, ARM templates were hard to pick up. Um, and then you couldn't do, at the time, you couldn't do as much with um, configuration. We have a lot of uh, piecemeal stuff, and that's part of the reason what, why we have the YAML, is we're able to take exact configurations and, and build the YAML. <laughs> or sorry, build, build the ARM template. So we're doing that in the back end for our, our customers. I see. Okay. And is there a way to like to benefit externally from your work? Is any of that is a part of some open source available to others? I wish it was. <laughs> uh, right now it's not. 
if I remember correctly, Columbia currently has a policy where we, we don't have open source. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't in the future. People can slowly start moving to the front. Okay. Yeah, so I'll make this I'll make this quick then for you. Okay. So you were starting to, you were using the Azure pipeline templates there and stuff like that. And were you an early adopter of um, being able to use templates? Because like for example, not all, okay. So you yes, were lucky. we were. Yeah, I'll say that for the people that can't watch, right? Uh, yeah, we were early. We work very very closely with Microsoft, so we try okay. to get all of the early features. Yeah, I was going to say, it's like a brand new feature for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of the struggles that you ran across when you were using pipeline templates coming from, let's say, the release management world? You know, coming from the more visual view versus going into, like I said, the templates themselves, which gave you a little more freedom. Um, so we were actually already using the YAMLs for the builds. Okay. Uh, so that was a good step in the right direction for us. But the biggest problem that we've been seeing, um, especially with the, the multi-stage templates, is all the functionality is not there yet. Gotcha. Um, so it's not a one-for-one one yet as much as we, so we've actually been ha having to hack some of the stuff. Gotcha. Yeah. Like the random PowerShell in there and that kind of. Yeah, we have, yeah. We have PowerShell being called within there yeah. to make Perfect. it work well. Yeah. Perfect. That's all I have. So do we want to move on to the discussion? Are there any other? Questions for Amanda? Okay. <laughs> we got three more minutes and then we move on to the discussion. Okay, so from my painful experience, how do you manage identities? There, there, there was a, a little bit of talk about RBAC, mm -hmm. but like assigning existing permission to existing entity is very simple. What about creating uh, identities maybe along the way or maybe it's not a part of what you need to do? Yeah, so our team does not handle creating identities. Um, but we internally we do have uh, act Active Directory synced up with Azure Active Directory and that's made a, a big difference for us. But yeah, our team specifically isn't responsible for, for okay. creating users. Yeah. So that's outside of fancy DevOps automation. <laughs> Some of the ADOS automation, it creates uh, some identities on the fly, but that's operated by a different team. Mm -hmm. But they're using this automation to do some of that. And there's also some, uh, some app registrations that happen in other parts. So we're dabbling a little bit in that, but that's not the mainstay of what's going on. Yeah, and we do, and we do create service principles as well. That's all through automation. But yeah, individual people, not at the moment. And, and just last confirmation, just to confirm I, I got the things right. You are using Azure DevOps as your major, which actually has a YAML of its own, right? Uh, as, as a major structure of the pipeline. And then you just use custom steps along the way that are invoking into the framework of your, of your own in PowerShell where you use custom pipelines. That's how the system is organized? Yeah, yeah. So we use um, Azure DevOps' specific YAML for builds and releases, or releases don't have it yet, but so the multi-stage pipelines, right? Uh, and then we have our own specific to, to have the individual um, settings, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now it actually is time for the discussion. So give another round of applause. Please move forward for the discussion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, come on, there's more of, more of you who want wants to discuss to be things. Involved in the discussion, or if as the discussion progresses, if you feel like a question pops into your mind or you want to contribute, please come up and we'll we'll do sort of a U shape here so those in the audience can can see us here. <laughs> so we have the three traditional questions and the first one is what challenges keep you awake you want to start richard so i'm in a developer advocate role and part of my job is also observability monitoring all of our systems there so the things that keep me awake actually are getting smaller and smaller um, but mainly it's been around uh, keeping our systems, logging systems up and running. I don't know how to respond to that. 
So I think one of the challenges I see is there's, there's a whole lot of mechanism in here, and there's this high level of what you want to achieve. And so there's kind of this gulf between, you know, here's our top level goal of what we want from automation and continuous delivery. And then here's just this plethora of mechanics and gears and so forth to get there. And some of it's based a little bit on, you know, where we've been. And so it changes in the frameworks and where you've got to use them. And so, you know, there's this, this, you know, visibility gulf between what we want to achieve and how we have to go about achieving it. And that's a challenge, I think, in a lot of frameworks is we're still building this stuff. And it's difficult to make that, that big picture view visible in the actual code that does that work. You, you want to respond to that one? No, not to that one. Sorry. Oh, we're the first one? No, no. I, think <laughs> I think, like, scoping this question to the topic that was discussed, I think the challenges on Microsoft how come template engine is not sufficient that uh, Columbia is probably not the only company that has to come up with some crazy custom solution that is not transferable from company to company. Uh, only concepts are transferable, not the actual solution and problems will be all new. Uh, I think that's the challenge. Uh, I try to work on purely template-based solutions, but I always struggle. There is always a resource that has to be created somehow manually. Uh, just because maybe maybe you need to do it in the multiple stages so that they can exchange some parameters just because the flow is so imperfect. I think in the end, template is just an afterthought for Microsoft. Any comments there? Yeah. The Did I understand that correctly? The template's an afterthought? Yes. Uh, okay, so I'll go ahead and do this one. Um, when I look at, like, I've, so I've worked with this, the TFS team since 04 and got to know a lot of them over the years and stuff like that. The, when we look at how the product has grown over the years and stuff like that and the input that, we t that they took, um, it was kind of trying to encompass it for a lot of people. So, you know, the way, let's say, Columbia does it first, let's say CDW or, or, or another big customer does it, is every different way. So to try to come up with a standard, like, like when you look at when the InCycle solution was purchased, God rest us all. Um, <laughs> so when you look at that, and it's like there was an expectation of it, but it, what, what was delivered wasn't quite, it was geared very much for like one type of source. And then, so from that, you saw them learn that, okay, one, that solution wasn't exactly good for most people. Um, people want a web-based solution in that case. So it became very iterative, and they were like, it's like the dog fooding they did on it, where, hey, is this what you're looking for? Is this what you're looking for? Is this what you're looking for? And it kind of like grew to the point like, we went from XAML build pipelines and that thing, and then we, condensed it, expanded it, and now we're condensing it again. And it seems to be just constantly learning that I don't think any of us really know what we're doing at times. Sure. No. It's, it's, it's not from the perspective of you know blaming. Uh, there is a lot of learning happening right now. Some of the books we uh, you know celebrated, they were not written when Azure as a service was already running and people needed to create things. So I understand why it happened. However, today, maybe your choice should not be Microsoft templating mechanism. Maybe your choice should be Puppet. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying. Maybe, maybe it will solve all your needs, right? Uh, and, and of course, for example, Microsoft Storage was classic till about just uh, two years ago. And what it means is that there is no template that covers it all together. So, I mean, there, there are practical reasons to, to say that. One question I would have is, have you seen it progress, though? It, it's incomplete, but has it progressed? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've only been with Columbia for a year, but even in that year, there's been a lot of changes. Um, before, we really had to hack the multi-stage pipeline to get um, requirements from our customers, and now we were actually able to strip a lot of that out because it is coming. And they they know that it's not perfect. They're they're constantly pushing forward. And do you feel like, as a customer, you were able to influence some of that change? Yeah, I know we are for sure. Uh, we work <laughs> we we work very very closely with uh, with them, and like I said, we are a Microsoft shop. Like that's everything we use, so we have a very good working relationship with them. And can I ask everybody to kind of form a U so that those in the audience can can see everybody too? So did we have other input here? 
So, I mean, for, for challenges, my, my team's biggest struggle has been the kind of speed of innovation for Microsoft where we, we Google something, how do we find it? We're looking up answers on Stack Overflow and we're getting everything from the visual designer. And then we build something out and then like, oh, multi-stage pipelines are coming, YAML's the way we should be doing everything. Oh, great, we just invested two man weeks in building out this solution that's maybe not actually what we should have built. So that's been my biggest challenge. Actually. I just remember like when there was Azure portal and I was like very happy and celebrating. Um, I think one point that is important to make for people in the audience is that if your scenario is complicated, complex, then maybe you need to end up some route of customization like was described. But I can see how for much of the prototyping and for maybe for some more simplistic workflows, you can actually successfully use Azure Portal, uh, not in terms of doing things manually, not of course, no, but you can actually do things manually once and then generate ARM templates, see what kind of things can be done on top of that, and that can be a perfectly well working solution for you. That, that, that was my point. Yeah, actually, so how I mentioned that it's fine in the sandboxes, our developers, when they're creating functions and APIs, that's exactly how they do it, is they de because we allow for um, ARM template override for in more features that they need that we don't have in our current ARM templates or that we haven't currently implemented. So they'll go ahead, they'll create it, they'll download the ARM template, they'll put it in their source control, and then they have it. Yeah. Okay, I think... Time-wise, we need to move on to the, the next question, right? Indeed. So, what's so a, yep. what are the success stories? Well, I was going to comment. You say you've wasted like two, two or three man weeks in something that turns out to be totally wrong because of, of um, either changes in the, the API or the fact that you couldn't get to it. Like, that's... That to me is a success. I've got clients who waste two man years and the you know the better part of nine months making that failing that same experiment, not realizing like six or seven months into it that this is a failing experiment. We should stop. So I mean, if you can recognize in two weeks, that's a success to me. So <laughs> and there are ways to take the snippets and transfer them to YAML now too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so you know, when I say it's a challenge, it's more just making sure we keep up with whatever's latest was was our problem. But that that two week experiment was actually going to be what I was going to say is was our, was our success story because we went from having ninety minute manual run book in Excel kind of deployments to our, to our production environments to I push something into the master branch and forty five minutes later with no one looking at anything, my client has the latest code. So I mean, from a deploying to paths, that's been great. So I like few people ever like ARM templates. I love ARM templates. Um, I've worked with Dave over the years, and I'm, I push these things constantly. The only downside I wish they had like a YAML version of it. I know there's like one conversion, but like because you can design like these ephemeral environments. And that's the second time I've said this right today. Uh, I never say that word right. So, but you can design these like so where you have again you can set up the stack the way you want to with the dependencies, and you can even like connection strings and all the other kind of stuff, so that a developer and that can it's like kind of pre dockerish in that way, but. Um, it allows you to get that ability, like the success I've seen with it with several clients over the years is that by, by templating that out, I know ARM, it's, it's a pain at first, but like once you get, like the IntelliSense is pretty slick on it, let's be honest. Um, and once you get to that point though, is like you can just start going from a feature branch to like basically create an environment out and do it. And so that's what we saw in like one of my clients down in Kansas City was very successful with it. And so it spins up like eight services and then tears them down, it's done, and that's it. So. Oh, that covers it? Okay. Other successes? We've got one coming up. We're all from the same thing. Yeah, one, okay. one thing I would mention is uh, like using some of these templates, I think it's, it's interesting being able to um, kind of pull out the compliance and, and checks and everything. And then, so you, you're, you're enforcing that for all teams across you know, many pipelines, in our case, hundreds of pipelines. And, uh, but you're still allowing the flexibility in each build to use the different technologies that are appropriate, right? Whether it be done at core, done at framework, Docker, Python, whatever it is, right? Now is, I think that's one of the things that's, where it's been successful to use the templates and stuff. And maybe for people to have more success stories, I just wanted to mention that Visual Studio Code has an extension that helps you creating ARM templates. Yeah. And there is a really interesting LinkedIn profile uh, of a guy named Michael Pfeiffer that talks a lot about stuff like that. Just 
remember to follow Michael Pfeiffer. It's not me. Uh, he, he, he is driving a podcast called Cloud Skills FM, where he talks about very dedicated topics, including how to author, things like that. Thanks for sharing. More success stories? Or do we move to the... If you could wave a magic wand. <laughs> if I could... There yeah. it is. If you could wave the... Sorry. <laughs> what would you want to see two to five years from now? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would really like to see a new edition of cloud delivery book. Uh, which would use Microsoft as an example how things should be done. How to do AAC. Look, this is how Microsoft does it. So everybody does it. So this is what I really want. Uh, I, I, I said something that people were not very comfortable, that I feel like some things are afterthought for Microsoft, so I wish it became actually first-class citizen in all senses. I would also like to see the SDKs fully fleshed out so we can get away from PowerShell. <laughs> I mean, I, I know, so um, I, I personally am not, I came from Java, so going to PowerShell from Java is, it was a hard, frustrating leap, I should say, more specifically. Um, so that would be awesome to be able to have full functionality in, in one. In anyone, I don't care. It could be full functionality in PowerShell, it could be full functionality, but that would be great, and so we don't have to do a mishmash. Uh, in response to uh, Andre, Andre uh, if you go to aka.ms, I believe it's DevOps-Stories, it doesn't get into all the details, you know, technically on the pipelines and stuff yet, but it does talk around about the culture of DevOps and it talks about testing and so there's some other topics and there's going to be other topics added there as well. And yeah, that's something I could take back to the team and say, yes, we'd like to Customers would like to understand more about how are we doing the deployments. And let's make it a check on the performance review also. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm trying to remember what her camera was right before that, though. SDKs. Oh, yeah. When you refer to the SDK, you're talking about like the actual like, C-sharp SDK, or you're talking about the CLI? C-sharp. Okay. Yeah. Do you ever use the AZ CLI? No. Oh. No. Whoa. Yeah. Well, well part, yeah. part of that is because we are focused on the PowerShell. Uh -huh. Um, and yeah, and we've also seen that not all functionality, again, not all functionality is in any of them. Right. So we don't want to add another technology on top of ours to get that mish, right? We don't want to build enough. more mishmash. Because like this is what I've done in the past is like where the AZ CLI will like it will output that to JSON, convert that to PowerShell object, and then manipulate stuff. I know that's kind of a hacky way, but I also am impatient. So um, yeah. that's was wondering like, why have you ever looked at that as well, like the CLI? Cause the CLI seems advanced at faster rate than the PowerShell module sometimes, but that's my opinion. So I'll just cut in front of him because um, he keeps talking. And, uh, but we're from the same company though, so for us, one of the things that I end up doing to make it a little simpler, um, you're talking about Azure storage. One of the easiest things that I used was uh, using Logic Apps mm -hmm. to spin those bad boys up. That helps out a lot. It's a little hacky way because it's like the easy way out, but it, it works really well and you can automate that pretty quickly. Um, what I would like to see though in the next two to five years, mainly around um, for us, and my org is more a further adoption of using um, YAML uh, templates and embracing it by all of our teams, uh, especially as we begin to go further into our cloud journey. I don't know where it's going to go, but it should be pretty cool. It's kind of what Richard's saying is like more investment into flow. Yeah. Like if you guys like, you're welcome. By flow, he means power automation. I'm not in marketing, but you know. <laughs> they changed the name. Actually, since the original question, what I would like to see in two or five years, I would like to see Azure CLI, Azure PowerShell, C Sharp SDK, and SDKs to other languages to be more on par. Because today we can argue that Azure CLI is, for some reason, better, but you know, PowerShell gives me all self-documenting features, which Azure CLI doesn't. Uh, and then what is PAT? PAT is a terrible concept. Why Azure CLI uses it? I want to log in with my user identity. Like, I don't want, uh, in, Azure, in Azure Active Directory, there are established concepts, and PAT is not one of them. Why Azure CLI even uses that? I'm, I, I just don't understand. And also, I wanted to say that uh, internal team in Microsoft that's responsible for developer experience, 
pays a lot of attention to PowerShell. And not that much attention goes to C-sharp SDKs and protocols. So right now, just pragmatically, that's the reason why PowerShell are actually the best compared to everything else. Because these guys will scrutinize us, internal teams, for every single little attribute we add. <laughs> Why do you add it? Why do you remove it? Backwards compatibility. On protocol level, people kind of don't pay that much attention. So I mean, from, from my wish list, maybe it's a little bit odd, but I'd like to integrate my pipelines with my application insights monitoring. Like right now, I don't really see that I have a pipeline that's about to deploy to a particular thing. There's nothing in my monitoring that tells me, hey, upcoming deployment, expect an application reboot or any of those kinds of things. All of a sudden, I just get flooded with log messages as my Java environment starts up and I get spammed by spring booting and everything else. So I, I'd like to see some warning that I'm, okay, this, this flood of trace is normal. It's not something I need to take action on. Could could that be done as a custom action? I mean, with application insights, you can do custom action. Just a thought, but a, but a good a good suggestion also. Yes. They're looking for one step task. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Yeah. First class deployment. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Good point. Do we have more wishes from the audience or? Three more. No. Well. Okay. In that case, applause to yourself, because thanks for the discussion. Thank you, everyone.